Fred Film Radio from the 80th Venice Festival. I'm Angela Cerbi. I'm here with Tim Kerger and Jan Bulov for the film The Theory of Everything. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, Tim, the film, uh, you wrote a play that... Did you, I? Did. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, no, I was... Uh, the, the film comes from... Um, uh, there is a book in the film. There is a book mm -hmm. that, that, mm -hmm. that turns into... Uh, another film yes. in the film. Yes. And uh, so just to make us confused, <laughs> more confused, and you talk about multiverse. Yes. Uh, like not, not, the multi, not, the, not the glamorous multiverse of, of Marvel Studios, but uh, the multiverse, like the serious one. What brought you to take this nearly complicated subject as... Well, the subject of the film. Um, it started out as just this kind of formalistic setting idea. Like we had this image in mind of 1962 set in the Swiss Alps. It mm -hmm. was a black and white film. It was about physicists, but I didn't know much more than that. My screenwriter, Roderick, came up with the parallel worlds mm -hmm. metaphor, I would say, yeah. which is now a lot of years ago. We wrote that film for quite a while and back then it seemed a bit original to us still and now the multiverse surrounds us but i i'm still very happy with the film because you don't necessarily expect a story like that no. you know in a in a film like this it feels like a european art house drama but it's also a hitchcock film and we also wondered like you know what what would hitchcock do if he had known about the multiverse um and there's a certain real sense of paranoia that can ensue if you really think about the multiverse. Like, is my life going the way it should? Or has it maybe gone wrong? And, you know, this science fiction topos, it's full of, you know, those scenes of doppelgangers mm -hmm. where people meet their own doppelganger or meet someone else's doppelganger. And there's always, inv invariably, there's that scene where the doppelganger is being asked a question, like, do you know, do you know the real answer to this question? This, this is the kind of test, who's the real person and who isn't? Um, but I think, I suppose, the answer in this film and the psychological horror that it, uh, that it tells is that there is no real you in that sense. Because in the sense, we are all our false doppelgangers, as it were. And actually, Ian, your character is in the mid of all this confusion. Yeah. You are playing this young physicist, which is a very, a very smart, but very shy very honest and simple and it just used as a scapegoat of this mystery that we can we cannot tell because it's a thriller friend so we don't want to spoil it so how did you work on this how did you play i did you uh, um, pair your simplicity the simplicity of your character to the complexity of uh the situation well um uh i mean uh, um it's about communication to Tim because, uh, sorry, uh, obviously Tim had a uh, had a very uh, exclusive imagination of that character, mm -hmm. and he just told me to to do what I what I have to do, and I listened to him, <laughs> and he wanted me to be as calm as possible, and also. Uh, I mean, if you have a metaphysical melodrama like mm -hmm. this, mm -hmm. it's a quote from, <laughs> but uh, uh, it's a good explanation for the movie, I guess. And if you have this, you you, you cannot uh, play the panic because if you play the panic part, no one will believe it. So you got to act as if everything was quite normal. So the audience can get into it because if you play like oh this is everything is so weird here then everyone else in the audience thinks maybe oh okay i got it but if you don't do it everyone will start to imagine it and this mm -hmm. is the great thing but i mean he's he's very cinematically educated i i'm really i really admire him <laughs> for his uh for his knowledge of uh, film and uh yeah, I just listened to him. Just listened to him. <laughs> I'm, I'm the dumb part here. <laughs> you I didn't do anything special. You are as simple as your character. Yes, is. yes. Actually, yes, because also we had that theme for the, when we come to the metaphysical stuff. Mm. I mean, I barely understand the thing there. And in case it gets scientifically, uh, I'm lost. But... Um, 
it's just like always acting is always uh, try to um was behaupten was heißt das noch mal uh, um uh, uh, I lost the word. I'm sorry, but but um, um, it's 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 kind of like you know you you gotta you gotta act as if you would know it, but I mean you barely understand anything. But you can work out a character with communication. Yeah, <laughs> and better. obviously we only have to go skin deep in cinema history to understand that in the film noir tradition, our protagonist does not need to understand. Exactly. The very point is that he does not understand. But this is the thing I didn't <laughs> yeah, know and yeah, you, yeah. you got me to know. So uh, yeah, I, I was dumb. <laughs> <laughs> Tim, you were talking about Hitchcock and, and it's very visible that there is a, an homage to the uh, Hitchcock movies. Mm -hmm. uh, both in terms of photography, the black and white, and the music. The music, music is very important. It's used mm -hmm. like yeah. it was used in the thriller film of the 50s and the 40s. Mm -hmm. uh, how did you work on that? I mean, was it complicated to do it? Was something that was too much sometimes for you? There was too much music, maybe or not? What were you oh, thinking? Never, 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 never. I, I started making films because I wanted to put images to music. And I sometimes I miss, you know, the mm -hmm. kind of late romantic opulence uh, of the leitmotif music that we yeah. used to have. And Bernard Herrmann up to John Williams, he's still alive, but nobody makes films like that really anymore. Some people still do, but now we have atmospheric drone soundtracks, which are very, very interesting, but they almost always play to one emotion. And I feel like in the very best film music that we used to have, uh, it, it could play to so many emotions at the same time. And I was very interested in that, to do this in this film, and not only do a quotation of Bernard Herrmann, but to translate it to something new. And we tried to do the same with the images. I, I, did have, I didn't have an intellectual approach to it. I just wanted the film to really feel like an old mm -hmm. film. But then at the same time, we realized, obviously, it's a film now made now. And that, you know, that shuffles the old cards in new ways, as it were, because it makes us feel a bit strange. Like, yeah. we don't really know what the film wants from us. The same with the music. And uh, I, I was really so interested and, and attracted by that. Yeah. Um, and I hope the audience can feel oh, that yeah, as well. Oh, yeah, totally, totally, yes. <coughs> we, are, we, we are there where we are trying to follow the film without knowing where the film is going to take us. And it works. So thanks a lot. Thanks a lot for the film. Thank thanks you. a lot to Thank Tim Kruger, Jan Bulo for the Theory of thanks Everything from the Venice Film Festival. I'm Angelo Cerbi from Fred, the Festival Insider. Thank you very much. Grazie. Grazie a voi. <laughs>